Welcome to the Manga Bay Newscast. It's April 6, 2022, and I'm your host, Mike Gorecki, bringing you the news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline. It's that time of year when many researchers are heading out into the field again, and for some, it's the first field season after a long hiatus due to the COVID pandemic. So we thought we'd check in with a couple field researchers and find out what they're working on. We speak today with Meredith Palmer, a postdoctoral researcher at Princeton University, whose fieldwork involves developing and testing new prototypes for emerging wildlife monitoring technologies. She tells us where she'll be this field season and what new conservation technologies she'll be testing, and tells us about the Boombox, an open source device that attaches to commercially available camera traps and turns them into automated behavioral response systems. We also speak with Umat Samji, a field researcher based out of the Smithsonian Tropical Institute in Panama. He tells us about his research that uses insects as models to understand the evolution of extreme structures in animals. I do a lot of field work. I mostly work with insects. They provide lots of opportunities to test hypotheses about the evolution of diversity. And the very specific thing I work on is the evolution of exaggerated sexually selected traits. So things like elephant tusks, the horns of antelopes, or the antlers of deer and cervids. Meredith Palmer will be spending a good part of 2022 in eastern and southern Africa, testing new prototypes of wildlife monitoring hardware and software. Here she is to explain. I'm in a really exciting position right now where I get to help develop new technologies for monitoring wildlife. So the idea behind that is is sort of, you know, the technologies that exist out there, um, your camera traps, things like that, for example, they're not made for wildlife researchers. You know, they don't do all of the things that they that we need them to do. Um, and we have things like, you know, the cell phone in your pocket has so much more computing power and so many more capabilities than the pen and paper and binoculars that ecologists are using out in the field right now. And so I have the very exciting job of thinking about all of these new emerging technologies that are slowly becoming part of our everyday life and trying to figure out how we can use them to better wildlife monitoring, um, assessing you know the impact of different conservation measures and really just helping to promote conservation in general. And so one of the things that I've been working on over the past couple of years is this sort of idea of making conservation technology so by wildlife ecologists for wildlife ecologists, right? So trying to really get those tools out there that do exactly what we need them to do, um, but are also affordable and accessible and open source and low cost, and that really allow researchers to take these frameworks, these platforms, and run with them and turn them into the tools that each individual researcher needs for each individual project they're working on. And so I think most recently I have been making, um, working on camera traps that react to the environment. And so the idea behind that is camera traps are a pretty common tool used by wildlife ecologists, right? So this is a remote camera that you're going to stick out on a tree in the savanna somewhere. And when an animal walks in front of it, it triggers the camera to take a picture or a video. So it's this passive wildlife monitoring device. And one of the things that I've been doing is turning that passive device into an active experimental unit. Um, So we've been modding out off the shelf camera traps with these little modular add-ons they plug into the camera. When an animal walks in front of the camera trap, it triggers this Uh, external modular device to play a cue, to play an audio cue. And so that turns what's happening into an experiment. The animal walks in front of the camera, it triggers a cue, the animal responds to that cue, the camera is video recording that response. And so we get this really beautiful, really elegant experiment where without all of those confounding influences of human observers being present, You have wildlife in a natural setting responding to cues that you program in as a researcher. So in my case, I'm interested in predator-prey dynamics. I want to know what anti-predator behaviors 
prey animals use to you know, avoid becoming something's lunch, uh, but those tactics are going to differ by what's trying to eat you. So I can program the noises of all kinds of different predators into these devices and amass these really massive sample sizes of animal responses to those cues. So that's that's one of several projects we're working on. So that device is known as the Boombox, and you've actually not just tested them out in the field, but you've already gathered experimental data with them, as you were saying. I know you published a paper with your findings last year, so we'll link to that in the show notes for this episode. But are you going to be out in the field to do more testing of this Boombox device this year, or are you going to be doing more of these behavioral response experiments? Yeah, so we, we made the Boombox device. Um, we started developing we started developing it um, before before COVID in the before times. So we've gotten two uh, field seasons worth of testing out of the boombox and how it works and amassed, again, you know, just a really wonderful data set for our scientific research. And the really great thing about the boombox now is, again, uh, we've released these designs open source. You can buy, you know, field kits from us, starter kits, so that you can make your own. We can help people tailor these to their own different projects. And so we have boomboxes being used now by, you know, half a dozen research teams around the world studying all kinds of, you know, everything from wolves to elephants using the boombox. So we are, you know, continuing to improve the boombox. I think something that's really great right now is that now that we have all of these different scientists and conservationists using it, They're suggesting all kinds of new features that we're building in um, to get, again, make it a device by ecologists for ecologists. But I'm not going to be testing the boombox again this year. I've got a couple exciting things lined up for the field this year. One of them is working with a company called Edge Impulse to develop a smart camera trap. So again, we're thinking about camera traps that are more than just these passive monitoring devices, but cameras that can sort of evaluate and respond to their environments. And so, you know, I think everyone at this point kind of knows what artificial intelligence is um, and computer vision. We have a lot of computer algorithms trained at this point to recognize different kinds of animals in camera trap images. And they're pretty good at that. And that's massively helpful for ecologists because usually camera traps are collecting tens of hundreds of thousands of images and having the help of a computer algorithm to sort through those massively reduces our workload and helps us, you know, turn those images into data so that we can respond to conservation challenges more quickly than if it, you know, we had to sit down for six months and go through all those images ourselves. But what we're trying to do now is take these algorithms, which typically run on, you know, a supercomputer in someone's lab, and we're trying to miniaturize them. We're trying to take these algorithms um, and optimize them for what we call low resource environments, which is a little jargony. (laughs) But the idea is that you want these algorithms to run sort of on the edge. You want to be able to deploy them in the field so that instead of deploying a camera trap that has an SD card in it, and you know, once every six months you go out, you collect that SD card, you bring it back to the lab, you upload the photos, they go to the supercomputer, it turns through your images. Instead of that whole process, you have this, um, we call it tiny ML. You have this little edge algorithm running in your camera, processing the images as they're taken. And again, like I said, we want these cameras to to be smart. We want them to react to the environment. And so when the camera trap detects that it's taken an image of an elephant that might be on its way to go raid some crops or a human that might be a poacher or a lion that might be some researcher's study organism, it will do something. So that might be send an SMS to the researcher. It might be play a loud noise to scare off the elephant. Um, So we're in the process right now of trying to create this hardware and software, which again, by researchers for researchers. So it's got to be open source. It's got to be cheap. It's got to be rugged. It's got to be customizable. Um, And we'll be creating those this year and deploying those in the field, which I think is going to be a really exciting endeavor. And I guess like a slightly tangential, (laughs) a related component of that is that a lot of the work I do is very heavily, I'm very heavily invested in capacity building. I recognize that I'm in a position of enormous privilege to be able to do the kinds of field research that I do. 
And so going and really strengthening the local scientific communities and building those up is really important to me. And so um, some of these processes and the development of these new technological tools, like training these algorithms, what we're going to be doing is running local hackathons in East Africa. So in Kenya, training up local computer science talent to help us develop the devices that are then going to be used to monitor their wildlife. So it's a really exciting collaborative initiative um, that I'm, you know, in a I think it's going to be six weeks where I'm going to head out to Kenya and start working on this project. And I think, you know, these big collaborative projects that have multiple missions are always really fun to work on. Yeah. So can you tell us more about where exactly you'll be doing this? And when you say you're out there field testing a device like this, what does that actually look like? Oh, well, we're going to be figuring that out as we go. Um, so I'm going to be working at Old Pejeta Conservancy, um, which is actually quite new for me. So I've done a lot of work in Tanzania, um, in the Serengeti ecosystem. I've done a lot of work in Southern Africa, a lot of work in Mozambique. Um, but I now have the opportunity to work at Old Pejeta. So at Old Pejeta Conservancy, there is a conservation technology lab, which is an initiative that we're actively building and trying to support and so this is a place that's going to have the conservation technology tools, the infrastructure that's going to help researchers import the equipment they need to fix the equipment, to teach people about all of these different technologies. So it's a really great base for me to be developing and testing these new kinds of technological tools. Um, so we'll be working um, at Old Pejeta. And yeah, field testing the camera traps is going to be a lot of, I mean, it always... It doesn't start out in the field, right? So the first iteration of the camera traps, you know, it's not very exciting. I'm going to rig up a couple in my living room. I have two dogs that I just locked away so that they wouldn't disturb this call. And I'm going to make them run up and down in front of these camera traps and see if we can set off some noises, if we can make them do something. It's a gradual process of refinement, right? Like there's so many things that you need to optimize in these situations, you have to get the algorithms to work. You have to get the, you know, the battery life to be reasonable. Some of these things are very resource intensive in terms of power. And, you know, it's not so great if you have a camera trap that works really, really well, but it can only last in the field for two days, right? And again, these cameras have to be rugged. Uh, they have to survive field conditions. And that's everything from dust and moisture and ants and being sat on by elephants, you know, there's a whole host of conditions out there they have to survive. And we have to make sure all these components work together, the camera traps, the external modules that, that do the things, the AI that we're embedding into the camera traps. And so it's a very multi-pronged sort of testing approach. You're monitoring a whole host of different things that can go wrong. And so as they fail and as you fix one thing, something else is going to go wrong. It's going to be a process. Um, but again, it's not just me. I'm working with some really great local and international collaborators. And, you know, once you have the whole conservation technology community supporting you and sharing ideas and helping you troubleshoot, that's really how you get forward progress in these kinds of initiatives. So when you get to Old Pejeta Conservancy in a few weeks here, you'll deploy some of these devices. But the point is more to see if they can withstand the rigors of being in the field rather than actually gathering any data on wildlife, for instance. Yeah, no, it'll be an iterative process. So I'm going to be hopping back and forth this year between the field and where I'm based right now in Cambridge. And so this will be sort of the, but this will be our prototyping adventure. We're going to go out with what we have and see what works and see what doesn't work. And then we've got to go back to the lab and we've got to fix it and we've got to optimize it and we've got to troubleshoot and we've got to figure out, you know, it's not it's not intuitive or easy working with these different kinds of technologies. And again, you really do need a whole community. You need a great collaborative team to push this forward. I'm an ecologist. I work with engineers for the hardware. I work with computer scientists to help me optimize the software. So we all get together and we're going to figure out, you know, how to make it based on these first trials better. And then later in the year, we will go back to the field. You know, we'll pop another couple of them up in Old Pejeta, scare a couple elephants, you know, um, bemuse a couple of, of zebra and wildebeest and see if we've done a better job. Developing this kind of hardware and software 
you're never ever going to get it right on the first go. <laughs> I mean, I don't, you know, what do you ever get right on the first go? But it will be a kind of a back and forth progress. And so we do see this taking, you know, a whole year, maybe longer to get to a product that we can then go and go to the conservation community and the ecological community and be able to share what we've created. And the really fun thing too is, you know, we're making these designs open source and we're going to be sharing our progress as we go. I think that's really important too. And not enough people talk about the failures, right? What goes wrong, what you tried that didn't work, how you fixed it. That's something we're going to be sharing too, because, you know, there's so many people who want a smart camera trap. There's so many ecologists out there who all need the same kinds of tools and people end up spending a lot of effort just trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, so the more open you can be, the more collaborative you can be. I think it really just helps people not make the same mistakes that you did um, and encourages people to work with you to make your device better and more effective. So no, it's not going to be this time that we're going to start collecting data. It might not be the next time in the field that we're going to start collecting data. But I really do hope, you know, by the end of the year, we might have something that's going to be helpful for researchers and conservationists. So eventually part of the process with this device will include field experiments because I remember reading in the study you put out about the boombox that you were collecting data on predator-prey interactions as a sort of proof of concept. So will you do a similar proof of concept study with the smart camera trap once it's ready? Yeah, definitely. We want, well, first of all, if I can, you know, I guess I didn't share the whole life cycle of the boombox with you. Um, and so that paper that you saw, that was us we got a device that worked. It did what we wanted it to do and we wanted to share it. We wanted to make it accessible for other researchers to you know, use it and build on it in their own research. But then what I've done is I've now deployed the boombox in several different places around Africa and have collected data that I'm currently analyzing and writing up as part of a scientific study. And so, like I said before, I'm interested, I'm interested in how prey animals like avoid becoming something's lunch. I'm interested in all of those anti-predator behaviors and strategies and tactics that, you know, what's going through a wildebeest's head on the day to day as it's avoiding, you know, being eaten by lions. And the thing that is most interesting to me is it's not just avoiding being eaten by lions. You know, as a wildebeest, you live in what we would call a, a multi-predator environment. So there's lions, there's cheetah, there's hyena, there's leopard, there's African wild dogs. You've got half a dozen large carnivores out there who are all interested in the same thing, which is catching and eating you. <laughs> um, and so what I study as a scientist is all of the proactive avoidance behaviors. So how do you, a wildebeest, move around your landscape in a way so that you don't encounter predators in the first place. And also all of the reactive behaviors. So like, how do you as a wildebeest escape from a situation where you've been spotted by a lion? Um, what do all of those behaviors look like? And so the boombox clearly helps us understand those reactive responses to predators. And it's an interesting question because predators hunt in different ways. And the different ways that predators hunt make different kinds of strategies more successful for escaping from them. So lions, you know, as big and ferocious a, a king of the jungle as they are, they're ambush predators. So if you spot them coming, they've lost the element of surprise. They're not going to chase you. They can't, they can't maintain that. So you're going to, or hypothetically, this is what we're testing. Hypothetically, you're going to do alerting behaviors. You're going to try and tell a predator it's been spotted. You might do an alarm call to alert all your friends there's a predator in the area. You might even do something called predator inspection, go up to the predator or maybe form a big defensive herd, um, safety in numbers, right? Whereas if the predator that is trying to catch you is something like a hyena or an African wild dog. Those are what we would call an active pursuit predator. So something that sees you and it takes off chasing you. And their strategy is just to chase and chase and chase to run you down until you keel over from exhaustion. A strategy where you hang around and make a lot of noise that that predator isn't going to be as successful. 
And so that's the kind of theory we're testing with the boombox. Do prey animals do different things when confronted with predators that exhibit all of these different traits? And the cool thing about the boombox experiment too, the actual research experiment, is that I'm deploying the boombox in sites that have different predator guilds. So some of the sites that we've deployed it at, um, they're all in Africa. And traditionally, the African Predator Guild is, like I said, lions, leopards, cheetah, hyena, African wild dog. But, you know, <laughs> thanks, thanks to humans, a lot of places in Africa don't have that complete set of predators anymore. And so by comparing how animals respond to all of those different predators in what we would call an intact site that has the full guild, compared to sites that only have one or two different kinds of predators, we can also learn a lot about how prey animals kind of remember and learn how to perform appropriate anti-predator responses. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to alert at an African wild dog to make an alarm call and at a hyena, because that's not going to help you escape. Um, and so knowing if prey animals actually kind of have a memory of what works to escape from different predators is useful information for people who are trying to restore predators to places where they've been lost. Because there's the, the worry that you're going to plop in a bunch of lions and your prey animals aren't going to know how to escape from lions if they've been living without lions for generations. And then you'll fall into what's called a predator pit where your predator will just chow down on um, and maybe drive your prey to local extinction because the prey just don't know how to defend themselves. So this is important. You know, it's a, we're asking a lot of different questions with this study, but the answers that we're discovering are interesting both from sort of a basic biological point of view, but also are going to be used to help guide future conservation efforts. Um, so apologies again for that interruption. I hope that gives you a better idea of what boombox is kind of you know, one of the things that can be accomplished with that kind of technology. Any final thoughts about your field work or conservation technology in general that you want to share with us? Yeah, I definitely have some thoughts about um, conservation technology uh, or the application of technology to conservation in general. I know when I sort of started off down this path, and again, I'm coming from a very strictly ecological background. I am an ecologist through and through, and I wanted to I wanted to do something different. I wanted to study wildlife in a different way. The kinds of questions I was asking, you need to collect hundreds of thousands of samples of animals, of prey animals running away from predators. And if I had to do that as an ecologist with my binoculars and my notepad, you know, driving around the savannah and my Land Rover, just hoping to see one of these encounters, it would take lifetimes, right, to collect that kind of data. But I didn't know you know, I had these ideas of what I wanted to do, and I just didn't know what was possible and what wasn't with technology. And so it's really, I think it's so important for ecologists to reach out to makers and engineers and computer scientists and just talk. You know, there's, it was easy to, well, not easy, but the technology available to make the boombox, to make these devices exists already. It was out there. You know, we weren't developing something new. We were using speakers from children's board games and Bluetooth like connectors from off the shelf products. Everything we need already existed. And I, as an ecologist, just wasn't aware that that technology could be used in creative ways to solve my research problems. And so there's a lot of organizations out there right now. Wildlabs.net is a big one. Conservation X Labs is another. These online communities that bring together ecologists, conservationists, makers, technologists, computer vision people into this big melting pot of ideas. And those collaborations are so important for pushing this field forward. Um, and I just think there's so much potential out there if we can just think outside the box a little bit and apply technology to these conservation problems. Um, you know, we're really in a stage right now where we can break new ground in terms of the types of data we can collect, the scale in which we can collect data. And it's, it's just really exciting to work at that interface. And then I guess like my one kind of dour caveat is technology isn't a panacea, right? You know, technology harms wildlife as much as it can help wildlife. So you do have to be you do have to be sensitive of that, but it's an amazing tool that we really should be using more in order to 
<laughs> to halt this you know, massive conservation crisis that we're living through right now. It's something that gives me a lot of hope. All right, now we'll turn to my conversation with Uma Samji, who is based at the Smithsonian Tropical Institute in Panama, where he is doing a completely different kind of fieldwork. He studies insects to gain insights into how animals like elephants evolve to have features like their tusks. But it's probably better if I let him explain it. So I do a lot of field work. Um, I mostly work with insects. Here in the tropics, in Central America especially, the insects are extremely diverse. And so they provide lots of opportunities to test hypotheses about um, the evolution of diversity. And the very specific thing I work on is the evolution of exaggerated sexually selected traits. So things like elephant tusks, the horns of antelopes or the antlers of deer and cervids are driven by sexual selection or competition for mating opportunities. And they are among the fastest evolving traits in nature. So we're trying to understand how animals can maintain the capacity to carry and use these large traits. Um, some of these structures in animals can be enormous. You can imagine the huge antlers in elk or the massive tusks in elephants. I tried to understand the energetic costs of using those traits and how energy might be shaping the evolution of those structures. Yeah, so this is really interesting. Can you explain a bit more about why you focus on insects in order to better understand these extreme traits of animals? So you can imagine that there's more than a hundred species of antelope and each species has its own shape and structure of horns. Uh, some are twisted, some are sh uh, straight and sharp, some are very thick and rounded. Um, they're used for different functions. Some are used for ramming, some are used for stabbing, some are used for wrestling. And it's really hard to, to do experiments on trying to understand how these traits function with different species of antelopes. They're enormous. <laughs> and um, you, know, you could usually find maybe work on one species at a time. That's kind of practical. It's more feasible to do that. But insects evolve these structures as well. So the insects that I study are in a family called the Choraidae or the leaf-footed bugs. And just like antelopes have horns, these insects have modified legs with spines on them that they use in competition. And these legs have diversified in form in different species. There's almost 2,000 different species in the family of insects. Some insects have long skinny uh, legs, Others have very thick muscular legs. Some of these legs have uh, massive spines on them. Others have, are bumpy and have all these um, structural support to them. So there's a lot of diversity in the hind legs. Different species have different hind legs. And because these insects are more tractable, I can watch them in detail. I can measure the energetic cost of those structures. I can find many of them and get big sample sizes to understand how they function and, and what advantages these traits might give individuals that bear them. So you said that these insects are abundant there in Panama, which presumably is what makes the Smithsonian Tropical Institute a good base of operations for you. What will you specifically be looking at this field season? The insect diversity is just higher in the tropics. There's uh, way more species of plants <laughs> and these insects feed on plants. And so there's way more species of insects as well. In Panama alone, there's hundreds of species of this one family of insect that I study, and they are really abundant here, but they're also sometimes really hard to find. Um, usually I'll find a few individuals of every species, and, I, and usually I need many individuals of a single species to be able to test some hypotheses. Um, and so it does take a lot of time and dedicated searching the field to find them. And the Smithsonian's a really good place uh, to do this work because you know, it's been based here for a long time. There are lots of facilities. There's lab facilities that I can use to do some very uh, detailed lab work. And having access to the facilities very close to the organisms really helps um, me do these studies quite a lot. Yeah. And so what are you going to be looking at this field season? And if you could maybe tell us, you know, what a, what a day in the life of a field researcher doing this kind of work looks like. For a lot of these insects that I study, we know they exist. So somebody's 
identified them. You know, usually more than a hundred years ago, somebody there's somebody's pinned a specimen and identified it as its own species. But for more than eighty percent of the species I study, that's the only bit of information we have about them. We often don't know what plants they live on. We don't know how widely they're distributed. Uh, we don't know what their day-to-day -day life is like. Uh, we don't know if they're active at night <laughs> or during the day. And so a lot of my work entails trying to find these insects and trying to understand their behavior. So that's the first step. So a few years ago when I started these projects, the first step was to really try to understand some natural history of these insects. And one of the things I ended up doing just to understand, like, what's the day-to-day -day life of this insect? What are the different selective pressures acting on individuals in the population? I found these insects that feed on heliconia plants. So these are brightly colored plants that are found in the tropics. They kind of look like those bird of paradise flowers. Females uh, feed and lay eggs on those flowers and males defend those flowers as territories. And they'll stay on a flower defending it as a territory that females come to feed at. So I was able to catch these insects and then mark and put little numbers on their backs. I'd literally write a number with a Sharpie on, on these insects' backs and then let them go and then come back and see where they ended up and what their day-to-day -day life was like. So I would check each flower, each inflorescence of these heliconia plants every day and get an idea of um, the social network of these insects. Um, so that's kind of one of the first things that I do. I try to understand the natural history and behavior of these insects. And then I get some idea of what's happening. So I see that these large males are likely uh, defending, are more able to defend territories because they have disproportionately large legs. Those, those large legs are used to defend these territories in combat with other males. And then I, I, I start asking more detailed questions. There's a really interesting finding with the, with the sexually selected traits, that's very general. Larger individuals bear disproportionately large traits for their body size. So for that heliconia bug, the one I just mentioned, a large male will invest about 16% of its body mass into these uh, legs that it uses for fighting. Uh, that's a, a big percentage of body mass. And, but a small male will dedicate only about eight or 9% of its body mass into the traits. So almost half the size into these weapons. And these small males also have disproportionately larger testes. So there's likely some opportunities for trade-offs between different types of competition that are shaping the evolution of these structures. Yeah, you've just been touching on this, but explain more about the energetic principles you're studying and how they help you understand the factors that shape the evolution and diversification of exaggerated traits in animals. Yeah, I, I'm excited to talk about it. So I'll start off with the, with the puzzle in sexual selection first. My research tries to draw connections between these two very separate fields of biology. Uh, the first one is sexual selection, which is competition for mating opportunity, which opportunities which drives evolution of a dizzying diversity of traits from the horns of rhinos to the horns of horned beetles, from the antlers of elk to the tiny antlers of little antlered flies that also fight kind of like elk. <laughs> the massive tusks of elephants to the tiny little miniature tusks of tusked weevils, the ornamented plumage of many birds and the feather-like ornaments of cannabis dwelling mosquitoes. So all these traits have evolved due to selection for co in competition for mating opportunities. And one other really interesting principle that we often find in these structures is that larger individuals carry larger traits. So the smallest deer species we know is uh, very small. It's about the size of a small dog like a pug and has tiny pointed antlers that account for only one tenth of one percent of its body mass. While as the biggest deer species we know to have ever existed, uh, the extinct Irish elk had massive flaring antlers about 12 feet across that accounted for about 10 percent of its body mass. So larger species often invest disproportionately more in these weapons compared to small ones. And uh, that has been a puzzle. That, that's called positive allometry. There's this different scaling of, of the sexually selected traits relative to body size as individuals get larger. And that's been a puzzle in sexual selection for a long time. And the second field of study in biology that I'm trying to draw connections with is the field of metabolic scaling. 
So larger animals use energy at a lower rate per gram of tissue compared to small ones. So an elephant will use less energy per gram of tissue compared to a mouse. And this finding that larger animals have a lower rate of metabolism per gram of tissue is found in insects, it's found in birds, it's found in reptiles, it's found in mammals, it's found in all these different species. But it's also really interesting to me that there's this economy of energy that animals get with this larger size. And I was wondering if that had something to do with these larger animals being able to bear these disproportionately large traits. Because they're getting energy savings as they get larger, maybe this allows them to carry disproportionately larger traits. Maybe this might, this energetic process might be a, a reason why these large animals might be able to carry these disproportionately large traits. I saw the paper you co-authored last year about weevils, and we'll link to that from our show notes so our listeners can check it out too. But would you tell us what that research found? Because I feel like that may help illustrate some of what you're talking about here. Yeah, ha yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. The, the weevil study was really interesting because, um, so, there are these, so weevils are really fascinating, uh, fascinating group of beetles. They're, um, they have this uh, rostrum or it's a modified mouth part that has diversified in, in many different ways in different species. And, and that's kind of a, a very um, distinctive characteristic of that group. But there's one group of weevils called the Brented weevils where that structure that modified, um, it's part of their head and mouth parts is modified into a fighting weapon. So in the New Zealand giraffe weevil, males have this extremely elongated head. It kind of looks ridiculous. It's like this long pole-shaped head that they use in jousting-like competitions for mating opportunities. And larger males carry disproportionately large heads compared to small ones. So a big question was, why is it that these large males can bear the costs of these likely energetically costly structures, why can they invest so much more in them compared to small individuals? And I mean, they look so ridiculous, these males with their long heads, uh, females look really different. In fact, when the species was first identified, males and females were described as different species because they looked so different from each other. So what's going on with this long head? Why do large males have this why can they have these traits that, why can they invest so much more in these, these structures? And um, so one of the things I did is I started measuring the metabolic rates of those weevils. So I put the weevils in little, little glass syringes um, and I could put a little oxygen sensor in that syringe and get a measure of its oxygen use. And just like what, what we see in different animal species, I found that larger individuals uh, use oxygen at a lower rate. Their rate of metabolism is lower per gram of tissue compared to small ones. And so this is consistent with what we found. But then the puzzle is, why do these large weevils carry these large traits and still have a lower cost, uh, a, a lower metabolic rate per gram of tissue? Um, so I had to look deeper into the structure of the weapon. And I found that the weapon is composed of cuticle, so that's kind of the hard exoskeleton of the insect. And inside that cuticle, there's nerves, muscles, tendons, and all those structures, those soft structures inside uh, the cuticle are metabolically active. So they, they consume energy and they, they use oxygen. And uh, what I found was these large, large males are increasing the size of the cuticle so that hard part that is mostly dead tissue Think of fingernails or hair, and they're not increasing the size of the energetically costly part. So they're getting an economy of size by just investing in metabolically cheap tissue. And the reason this um, is interesting is it kind of allowed me to start looking at different sexually selected traits that different animals use. And I found out that most of the time, uh, these traits are composed of this dead, metabolically inactive tissue. So think of the keratin that's found in the feathers of birds or in the horns of antelopes and bovids or the bony antlers of elk or the ossicoins of giraffes or the dentine found in elephant tusks 
or the modified cuticle that's found in beetle horns and fiddler crab claws and other uh, insects that have these modified weapons. All those structures are composed of this metabolically inert tissue and are not using energy uh, to the same extent that muscle would. Um, and so that might be a way that these animals are able to bear these large traits is by reducing the metabolic cost of maintaining them. Is there anything else you want to tell us about what you'll be studying in the field this year that our listeners might want to hear about? Yeah, so <laughs> one, of the, one of the fascinating things about studying uh, insects that people haven't studied the behavior of before um, is that you're constantly finding out new things and you're trying to make sense of it. So there's this one species of insect in, that's found here in Panama that has these uh, large flattened flags on its legs. So they're flattened cuticle on their hind legs, and they just increase the surface area of the insect quite a lot. So the surface area of those legs combined are more than the surface area of the, the insect's dorsal surface. So they're just these huge structures. And um, nobody knows what they're for. So we thought, just like the modified structures in other insects, those structures were uh, used in sexual signaling, sexual competition. But what we found was that there's not a lot of evidence that they're used in sexual signaling. Usually sexual signals are more prominent in one sex relative to another. So imagine most bird species, males are very colorful and ornamented compared to females. But in these bugs, I found both males and females had these big, brightly colored structures. And so it, it really is a puzzle <laughs> as to what they're for. So here in Panama, they happen to grow on the passion fruits and they are a pest on passion fruit. And so part of my field work is uh, driving to some areas where people grow passion fruit and trying to collect some of these bugs and set up a rearing co colony and, and uh, trying and then measuring uh, these legs, trying to take videos of their behavior, trying to see how they use those legs when they're flying, because these legs might act as air brakes, so they might uh, allow these insects to, to maneuver really nimbly in the air. And so that's one of the, the things I'll be doing this summer. Because big plantations of passion fruit are often, they, they often spray, those plantations, there's lots of different insects that would feed on passion fruit. It's, it's very hard for me to go into a plantation to find these insects. So I do have to drive around and find people who are growing maybe one or two plants in their backyards and ask them if I could have a look on, at their plant and see if I could find a bug or two um, and, and slowly collect bugs. Um, and I can also collect them from the wild. So they're found in wild passion fruit as well. So it also entails some hiking in the woods, trying to find some passion fruit vines and trying to see if I can get some bugs from there. If you enjoy the Manga Bay newscast, we ask that you please help spread the word by telling a friend. That's the best way to help expand our reach and keep the show growing. Another way to help is by becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com slash manga bay. We are a non-profit news outlet, so just a dollar or more per month would really help us with offsetting production costs and hosting fees. So if you're a fan of our audio reports from Nature's Frontline, please head to patreon.com slash manga bay to learn more and support the Manga Bay newscast. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash manga bay. You and your friend can join the listeners who've downloaded the Manga Bay newscast more than a half a million times by subscribing to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. Or you can download our app for Apple and Android devices. Just search either app store for the Manga Bay Newscast app to gain fingertip access to all of our new shows and all of our previous episodes. And of course, you can read all of our news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com. Or if you prefer to keep up with us on social media, follow us at facebook.com slash mangabay or on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle is at mangabay on both those platforms. Thanks as always for listening to the Manga Bay Newscast. I'm your host, Mike Gorecki, signing off. Talk to you again in two weeks.